would like to welcome everyone once again to this month's Wildlife for Lunch webinar. This month's webinar is going to be on managing freshwater ponds, what's best for you. It's going to be presented by Todd Sink. He's an aquaculture and fishery specialist for Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. This month's webinar is made possible through funding provided by the San Antonio Livestock Exposition Incorporated, and it's hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Todd, with that, I'll give the controls to you, and you should be good to go. All righty. Um, like I said, uh, or well, as Clint already said, um, today I'm going to talk about um, pond management, specifically um, fish management. Sorry about these, the uh, cover slide here. Um, it's just one of those presentation deals where it kind of didn't translate. But um, pond management is a difficult topic to cover in an hour. Um, my normal programs are two and a half to three hours. So um, we're going to address three key aspects today that Clint kind of wanted me to cover. Um, the first, we're going to go over some basic pond ecology, because if you don't understand the pond ecology, you might not understand some of the management um, decisions that we're going to make later on based on the pond ecology. Second, we're going to cover um, some fish stocking strategies. And then finally, we'll uh, end it with um, some fish management strategies and, and how you manage that population once you've already stocked and have it established. So to get started, I always like to start with um, clearing up some um, common misconceptions that people have about ponds. And the first one is always um, that people want their pond to be clear. They want to um, see their fish, and they think that clear water is good. Um, good water for fish. However, it's, it's the exact opposite. Clear water is bad. Um, clear water means that it has no food in the water column for the fish population to grow and thrive. So we want to get away from that misconception that you want clear water in your pond. Second one is uh, that fish need rooted vegetation, um, either for cover, shade, or habitat. Um, this is common because people are used to, to catching fish around weed beds in, in that type of uh, uh, farm pond setting. However, if you look at um, our commercial aquaculture ponds where we're growing 10 to uh, up to 16,000 pounds of fish per acre, there's not a single sprig of vegetation in those ponds and I guarantee you that if there is, that fish farmer is out there treating it the next day. Um, fish do not need rooted vegetation at all in order to have a good viable population and to thrive. Um, the next one is that fish need deep water. Um, the most common thing people say is that they either need a cool refuge or some type of deep water sanctuary. This is completely and absolutely not true um, in terms of a small impoundment, a farm pond. Um, Deep water in a small impoundment can actually cause many more problems than good um, simply because here in Texas it's very hot and we undergo what's called a hard stratification, um, especially during the summer months where the uh, top layer of water in a pond, about six to eight feet deep, um, is heated by the sun. Six to eight feet deep, you'll have a thermocline, and below that you'll have cool water. However, as the summer progresses, um, the oxygen is completely removed from that bottom layer and the fish really cannot utilize that deep zone at all. And so most people um, talk about turnover events. Well, this is the type of situation that creates a turnover event. So we really don't want deep water in our ponds. In Texas, um, normally six to eight feet deep is good and we want to go ahead and add two foot depth for to uh, uh, account for evaporation and water loss during the course of the year. So typically we're looking at, we really only want our ponds to be eight to 10 feet deep. Um, next one, um, this isn't really a misconception, but um, clearing up some other misconceptions, fish are in fact cold-blooded. And what that means is that they're the same temperature as their environment. So. It doesn't matter that they need a cool water sanctuary or warm water because wherever they are, they are that temperature. It doesn't bother them at all. Basically, it just makes their metabolism faster or slower. 
What it does mean, though, however, is that they have lower energy needs. Um, we as mammals devote 80 to 90 percent of our energy simply to uh, maintaining a constant body temperature. Since fish are cold-blooded in their temperature, their environment, they don't have to burn that much energy. What that means is fish don't have to grow. Um, they will stunt. Um, few people realize that a largemouth bass can survive on just six meals a year. Um, that's all they need. They will not grow. They will not reproduce, but they will survive. And so their energy requirements are much lower. Some other mis common misconceptions that we see all the time are um, crappie, hybrid sunfish, and yellow catfish with flatheads, flathead, uh, cat, I'm sorry, flathead catfish are okay to stock in a pond. Um, in general, we want you to stay away from these species. Um, yellow cats or Flatheads are never okay to stock in a farm pond. Hybrid sunfish, in some situations, they can be a good pond species. Um, crappie, in general, we want you to stay away from, but we'll discuss our stocking strategies a little bit more. Another co mis common misconception is that I need to add bass or other sport fish to my pond every few years. Um, that is the complete opposite of what you actually want to do in terms of managing a farm pond. Uh, to properly manage a farm pond, you actually need to harvest and remove bass every year, not add. Um, the next one, should I practice, or I should practice catch and release? Catch and release is a great management tool that works in large reservoirs where there's heavy angling pressure, lots of predation, and lots of environmental factors that influence more fish mortality. However, in a farm pond, you should not practice catch and release in terms of your largemouth bass population. Um, it's too difficult to maintain balance if you're not harvesting some of those fish each year. The next one I see a lot of times are people walk down to their pond bank and they see lots and lots of little bait fish swimming around. And so they assume the presence of um, uh, many fish means that there's sufficient food in the pond. Um, but that is not necessarily the case. Um, the presence of lots of small fish could be an indicator of many things. Um, it could mean that only a small size is available for smaller fish. The larger fish don't have much to eat. It could mean that your fish are already stunted. So the presence of many small fish doesn't necessarily mean that you have adequate food in that pond. All right. Now, to kind of highlight this principle, think about it. Fish don't chew their food, right? You know, sharks and some other species do, but unless you're raising sharks in your pond, your common pond species do not chew their food. That means they basically have to swallow their food whole. And that means the mouse size determines its prey size. So that bass out there swimming in that pond can only swallow a prey item that will fit into its mouth. So if we have a bunch of 10-inch bluegill, or I'm sorry, 10-inch largemouth bass swimming around out there, and we have a bunch of 8-inch bluegill, well, that bass is probably going to be starving because he cannot swallow an 8-inch bluegill. He can't get it in his mouth. To further highlight two points, this photo highlights two things. One, mouth size is, uh, determines your prey size. And for those of you that don't recognize this, that's a flathead catfish with a uh, uh, full-size basketball in its mouth. And so if it can fit a full-size basketball in its mouth, um, it can easily swallow a 10-pound largemouth bass. And that would be heartbreaking for most individuals because most individuals, their goal is to, just to get that one double-digit bass in their pond. And to realize that it can be consumed in one gulp by one fish and be gone um, highlights the fact that we do not necessarily want flathead catfish in our ponds. All right, so if you're a bass fisherman like me and you want to catch lots of big fish, you know, your goal is to raise largemouth bass like these, right? Or maybe you're a pan fisherman and your goal is to raise um, bluegills such as these. I mean, I don't care who you are, but when uh, your bluegill begin to have foreheads on them, 
those are pretty good sized bluegill. Now, but in order to grow those fish, the real question that we have to answer is how do we develop a strong food chain? Well, the food chain starts with plants, right? So, in our system, we don't have grass and cows and such. What we have are our little single-celled algae out there. Um, we're not talking about those, um, the algae, the filamentous algae that forms those big nasty mats. We're talking about the small single-celled algae that gives the water a slight greenish tinge. And that's where, you know, we don't necessarily want that clear water. We want it to have some green color to it. And what that is, all those cells are out there floating around. And then this is our herbivore of the system. This is our grazer. Um, this is zooplankton. In this case, this is a little daphnia. But zooplankton are small crustaceans out there drifting around, and they're the primary consumers of plant material in the system. They're out there grazing on this algae. And so they're out there floating around. They run across some algae, and they consume it. Well, after they consume the algae, they in turn feed our bait fish and our young sport fish. So think of our um, bluegill up to two inches, our largemouth bass up to an inch and a half. Um, so your sport fish are also going to be eating those open. Well, those bait fish in turn feed, well, my animation did, did not work. Yeah, animation did not work. Sorry, but that was a, a bluegill coming out to eat the bait fish, and then a bass coming out to eat the bluegill. Um, so that's how the basis of our food chain works. So, food chain start with plants, right? Now, everybody knows what this image on the left is, right? That's a fallow field. That's the equivalent of clear water. Think about how many cattle you could graze on that fallow field. Not very many, right? Maybe one very, very skinny cow. However, when we look at green water, this field is the equivalent in green water. Nice, lush, green, lots of grass. You think that we could grow a lot more cattle in this field, right? Well, you can grow a lot more fish in water when it has a nice green color to it. So how do we get that nice green color in our ponds? Sometimes they have enough natural fertility that they'll develop on their own. Other times it's necessary to fertilize. Just like you would fertilize that pasture to get the nice green grass, we need to fertilize our ponds sometimes. So when we're talking about fertilizers, we first have to look at what's limiting. On terrestrial crops and terrestrial environments, uh, nitrogen tends to be the most limiting nutrient to plants. However, in the aquatic environment, phosphorus is the most nutrient limiting because phosphorus precipitates out of water. Okay, so basically it sinks to the bottom and it's locked up in the pond sediment where the uh, phytoplankton, those little unicellular algae, can't get to it. So, what we want to do is most ponds in Texas will benefit from a spring application of five to eight pounds of phosphorus per acre. Um, and we generally apply that as soon as the water temperature is above 60 degrees and stable. Now, is this a one time a year deal? No, it is not. What you're going to have to do is possibly up to five times a year, but generally it's every uh, month and a half or so you're going to begin to notice a change in the water color. It's going to start to clear up. It's not going to be as green anymore. And so at that point, we want to go ahead and fertilize uh, at half the original rate. So if we fertilize with five to eight pounds of phosphorus per acre in the spring, well, our next one is going to be, um, you know, say we use six pounds in the spring, we're going to fertilize at three pounds of phosphorus per acre in our follow-up treatments. And that's just to keep that bloom going, keep fresh nutrients going to and keep our food chain strong. Now, there is an alternative. Rather than using um, those inorganic fertilizers, um, we in the aquaculture industry have known for, for the last about four decades that an excellent, cheap, organic source of fertilizer 
is to use 150 to 200 pounds, 250 pounds of cotton seed mill per acre. Now, cotton seed mill is very high in phosphorus, and since it is a plant material, it decomposes slowly, releasing phosphorus to the water over time. So, what we want to do is make sure that we apply that uh, cotton seed mill in shallow water less than 24 inches around the edge of our pond. We don't want it in water more than two feet deep because we want that phosphorus to be released in the upper column where sunlight penetrates so that we can develop um, algal populations rather than fertilizing our rooted vegetation. So when we're talking about fertilizers, I have no idea why that screen just skipped, but um, why would we fertilize? Well, the main reason we would fertilize is we would increase our fish production four to six times. Um, in an unfertilized pond, you can typically produce between 75 and 100 pounds per acre. So that sounds like a really good fish dryer, right? 100 pounds of fish, you know? However, that is all fish of all sizes. So that might be two to three harvestable sized fish supported by a bunch of medium sized and even more smaller fish in even more fish fry. Okay? So that's not a lot of poundage. Now, if we fertilize, that one acre of water can support 250 to 600 pounds of fish prey. Sounds like a whole lot better fish fry, right? Now, there is one important caveat to um, fertilizing your pond. If you already have um, thick growth of rooted vegetation, do not fertilize the vegetation problem worse. You need to go ahead and treat that rooted vegetation with the appropriate um, herbicide uh, beforehand, and then once you've taken care of that, go ahead and fertilize. That way, your nutrients are going to your phytoplankton and not to the rooted vegetation. What this also does is once you create that bloom with the fertilizer, it kind of acts as a pond dye would. It basically shades out rooted vegetation to help prevent it from becoming established in your pond. Now, one really important thing is do not over fertilize. We see this all the time. Um, it's pervasive in our um, in our society today that if a little bit is good, a whole bunch more must be better, right? Well, the problem is it's not. A little bit of fertilizer can really benefit your pond, bring on your fish production, improve your overall um, ecosystem. However, if you over fertilize, you can accidentally kill everything. We'll talk just a little bit more about that in a moment. But first, I wanted to discuss well, how do you know if you have enough fertilizer? Well, this picture on the right here is this real, real fancy scientific tool. It's a tool called um, a Secchi disc, and we use that to measure something called the Secchi depth. And for those of you that don't want to buy this real fancy, expensive tool, you know, I think they're like $13.95 on the internet. Um, all you really need to do is take an old one gallon paint can lid or a pie tin and spray paint it completely white and then attach it to either a string or a yardstick. And you, you would basically make yourself your own second disc. So how do you use a second uh, disc? Well, you lower it down into the water to the point where you can no longer make out the difference between the white edges or between the white and the black. Um, they're going to get kind of fuzzy and disappear. Then you slowly raise it up till just when the edges become clear. And at that point, you make a mark where the water line is, and that is your safety depth. We're basically just measuring visibility. So if we have 18 to 24 inches of visibility, we have a good bloom. If we have more than 24 inches of uh, visibility, we actually need to fertilize. 
if you had 12 to 15 inches of visibility, um, your phytoplankton has become too dense. Um, at this point, you want to discontinue all fertilization until you breach down uh, back to about that 24 inches of visibility mark. And if you have a visibility of 12 inches or less, um, you better be seeking emergency aeration real quick because you're very likely going to have a oxygen depletion event during hot weather or at night. And what happened is the bloom has become so thick that it's overpopulated and it will suck all the oxygen out of the water. Most people know that um, plants photosynthesize and they produce oxygen as a byproduct. What most pond owners never consider is the fact that what happens when the sun goes down? Well, that's, those plants are still living tissues and they still need to respire. So all night long, they're consuming oxygen. And so that's why most of our low dissolved oxygen fish kills occur right before dawn, because all night long, they've been depleting the oxygen from the water. If you get your bloom to an intensity that it's um, less than 12 inches of visibility, well then that bloom is so thick that it's likely going to create an oxygen crash at night and you're going to end up with a fish kill. So that's why um, a little bit of fertilizer in the appropriate amount is good. Adding too much is very, very bad. So this is just kind of an example of your uh, on food chain. And this is just to kind of reemphasize um, how important developing those uh, that algae population is. So, in order to grow a one pound largemouth bass, it takes 10 pounds of bluegill. So, in, in order to grow that one single 10 pound largemouth bass that you wanted in your pond, that double digit fish, it's going to take 100 pounds of bluegill. Well, to get that 100 pounds of bluegill, it's going to take 1,000 pounds of zooplankton, worms, insects, and crustaceans. And in order to get that 1,000 pounds, it's going to take 10,000 pounds of um, plants, um, include mainly your algae, or in some limited use of macrophytes. So you can see how important it is to build our food chain from the base up. We really want to increase that algae that supports the primary productivity and moves up so that we can develop those good fish populations that we want. There is an alternative to fertilization. For those of you that think this just is way too complicated, you don't want to spend all that time with the second disc um, figuring these things out, the alternative is feed your pond. Basically what you've done is you skip the bottom two rungs of that pond food chain. All right, so you went past the um, phytoplankton and the zooplankton, and now you're directly feeding the bait fish and the bluegill that will in turn support your larger fish, such as your largemouth bass. So when we talk about feeding our pond, we, we should talk in some length about our fish feed. Now, the first one that I will say is buy what you need, not what looks good. Um, here we have um, some examples, some bags on the right. Um, so up above we have uh, Aquamax, and we have down below that we have Green and Game Fish Chow. And so fish companies have figured out how to market these products. And so the top one has these nice pictures of hologra uh, holographic fish on it. The bottom one has catchy slogans like growth and vigor. Um, and so it's the same as the, the fishing lure market. Fishing lures are not designed to catch fish. They're designed to catch fishermen. Because once the fishing lure company has sold the fishermen the lure, they've already got their money. They don't care if that fisherman catches a fish with it or not. They have to make it look good and appealing to the fishermen to buy it in the first place. Well, the feed companies are using the same thing. Over here on the left in this plain white plastic bag, um, we see a uh, fish feed that is just labeled aquaculture. The problem is these two feed 
bead bags on the right cost around um, 50 to 60 dollars per a 50 pound bag. The fish feed on the left cost around 30 dollars um, for a 50 pound bag. When we look at the label, they're nutritionally identical. They're the same thing. You're paying for the package. So buy what you need, not what looks good. So what do you need? Well, remember, these are only supplemental feeds. If you stop feeding your fish in the pond, do they stop eating? No, they continue eating um, the bait fish and the uh, uh, zooplankton and the other things in that pond, right? It's not like a cattle feedlot where those animals have no other access to food, so you have to feed a dietary complete diet that provides everything that animal needs um, for growth and reproduction. In this case, we just need supplemental feeds. And so when we look at our supplemental feeds, the most important thing we want to discuss is our protein. Um, it's the most important in terms of getting growth onto your fish, but it's also the most expensive, so you don't want to pay for more than what you need. Okay? So what we're going to be looking for in most cases is we only want a 1 8 inch floating channel catfish feed. Now, you can buy a 1 quarter, but we generally recommend a 1 8. The reason for that is you're really not feeding um, your bass. Um, bass don't consume pellets. Um, what they what you're doing is you're feeding those bluegill that will in turn feed the bass. So we want to make sure that the pellet size is small enough that we can feed our smaller bluegill so they're growing well and so they can grow up and begin to feed our bass. Um, floating feed is very important because how do you know if you've fed enough and if your fish are eating? Um, if you use a sinking feed, it's immediately out of sight um, and you can't determine whether or not your food's being consumed. Excess feed building up on the bottom can actually cause an oxygen depletion as well. So, what we need is just a standard 28 to 32 percent protein feed. And we need a feed that is 4 to 7 percent lipid. That's all you need for your pond. There is no need to be out there buying 42, 46 percent protein, 15 percent um, uh, lipid feeds unless you're raising salmon in your pond or if you're raising a species in a monoculture with no other access to feed. So in other words, if we were doing aquaculture of say hybrid striped bass, we would want to feed a more uh, a higher protein, higher lipid feed, but you're only feeding supplemental to your pond. The next note is only feed what the fish can eat in about a 15 minute period. Um, this is a common problem we run into. Um, there's a couple of examples. One is grandpa goes down to the pond and feeds the fish. Well, he fed the fish their normal daily allotment and then down, chum down the hill comes grandkid number one. He's like, ooh, grandpa, can I feed the fish? And then he throws in a couple handfuls. And then down the hill runs grandkid number two. And then she wants to throw in some feed, so she throws in a couple of handfuls. Well, you've overfed your pond, so um, you might as well be throwing your money into the pond because fish feed is normally only water stable for about 15 to 20 minutes. After that, it begins to break down rather quickly and it's lost, so you're not feeding your fish. Another example are, is when uh, someone's using an automatic feeder and they have it set to the correct rate during the summer. Well, as fall uh, arrives and the temperatures begin to cool, the fish metabolism slows down, they stop eating so much, and that person forgets to adjust to fall feeding. And it continues to feed at the high summer rate for, you know, several weeks. Well, that can cause enough excess feed buildup to cause an oxygen push. Not to mention, it's an inefficient use of your money. You're wasting your money. So those are just some things to keep in mind when you're choosing a fish feed and how much you're feeding. So let's move on real quickly to stocking. The first thing I always cover is what do you do when things go wrong? Um, it's real simple. 
It's called this, it's this chemical called rhodonone. It's made from the roots of plants that grow in um, uh, the Amazon and Southeast Asia. And uh, it is a fish toxicant that actually binds through their hemoglobin so that it can't carry oxygen anymore. And you basically kill your entire pond off and start over. Um, it's an expensive process, it's a time consuming process, and you don't want to do it. Unfortunately, this is really the only thing that we have to quickly turn around a pond. Now, some ponds, depending on the problem, can be turned around through intensive management, but it takes many years of intensive management to correct the problem. Most pond owners aren't willing to break, wait that long, so road nodes are only option. Now, we don't want any of you to be placed in this situation, so I'm going to walk through how to stock your pond correctly the first time so that this doesn't happen to you. So, if when we're talking about stocking strategies, you first have to consider the size of your pond. So, if you have a pond that's one surface acre or greater, that's fantastic. You can stock largemouth bass, um, you can stock bluegill, you can stock red ear, you can even stock catfish. And I have a question mark there by catfish because we're going to go really into more depth on catfish in a little while. If you have a pond less than one surface acre, we do not recommend bass. Um, the reason for that is because bass can quickly become overpopulated and stunt in ponds less than one acre. Um, can bass be stocked in ponds less than one acre? The answer is yes. It takes a lot of intensive management and you must harvest your bass in order to keep them under control. It can be done but we find that most pond owners aren't willing to do this, so we just generally don't recommend that you um, stock bass in ponds less than one acre unless you're willing to dedicate at least six or so hours one day a week to managing that pond. However, if you have a pond that is less than one surface acre, don't worry. I've been, we've got lots and lots of fantastic fish stocking options for you. Um, the first one is simply a, a uh, kind of a meat pond. It's a catfish pond. So you can stock channel catfish or blue catfish in fathead minnows only. Um, often in these ponds you do a little bit of supplemental feeding to, to help the fish grow along. But it's basically a put and take type pond. Um, you uh, stock the fish. Um, as they begin to reach market size, about a pound and a half or so, then you're going to go ahead and harvest them um, through angling um, or other methods. You can sing as well, but typically through angling. And you catch your fish and you have a good fish fry. Then you restock. Um, the next one is, or the next option is actually one of my favorites. Before I moved to Texas, I was with the University of Arkansas system in. I had two small ponds that I had access to and, and I helped manage. Um, one was a half acre and one was three quarters of an acre. And they were uh, hybrid sunfish ponds. And the reason I loved the hybrid sunfish ponds were they were great for my kids. I could take them, that, my two young daughters there, and dad never had to bait hooks or do anything. The kids never got bored because all we needed was a shiny gold hook under a bottle. No bait. Hybrid sunfish are really aggressive at anything that shines or flashes in the water like that gold hook in his movie, they're going to strike at it. Um, as far as fighting and sport, they're fantastic. I used to love going down there with a ultralight rod and two pound test and those things would fight and fight. Pound for pound, everybody knows bluegill put up a pretty good fight. Um, has anybody ever caught a lot of um, pound and a half, two pound uh, sunfish, well, that's very easy to get your hybrid sunfish to pound and a half, two pounds. They uh, exhibit what's called hybrid vigor. They grow much faster than either of their parent species, and they are quite a bit more aggressive to eat a wider range of food items because one of the parent species is the green sunfish, and a green sunfish has the largest mouth size um, proportional to body size of all the sunfish. 
So basically what you get is a bluegill with a kind of a bass sized mouth. And they're super aggressive, they taste great, they bite tremendous. So you basically, this is another stock put intake. So you're going to put them in, wait for the fish to grow, maybe do some supplemental feeding to get the best growth out of these guys. And then you're going to start catching them, uh, angling for fun, but you're also going to start removing them. Once you've removed about 50% of your population, you're going to go ahead and restock. Now, our hybrid sunfish um, sterile, I get this question all the time because um, a lot of um, fish suppliers like to tell people that they're 98% male so um, or that they're sterile. They are, in fact, not sterile. They are not sterile in any way. They are reproductively viable. That means they will breed with each other or they'll breed back with either of the parent species. So if they're present, they will cross back with them. Now, as far as the 98% male, what they're doing is citing one study that was done at a university in a lab under controlled circumstances. That one study, they got 98% males. What we're actually finding out in our commercial aquaculture when we're producing these for sale as sport fish, we're only getting between 80 and 88% males. So there are quite a few more females in there than what most people let on. And those females and the males are sexually viable, so they will reproduce. The problem is the offspring are not as good as either of the parent species. Um, the green sunfish genes tend to be more dominant than the bluegill. So as you cross breeding back, you keep going back to that um, uh, green sunfish uh, phenotype. And so over time, you're basically breeding a true line of green sunfish. And those aren't a desirable species. So we really encourage you to put these fish in, grow them, harvest them. Your next op um, option is also another type of uh, basically a meat pond. And you can grow your catfish, hybrid sunfish, and fathead minnows all together in the same pond. So that's another stocking strategy. Um, it provides lots of angling opportunity, um, some fun species to catch, and it's also going to be great for table fare for those of you that like to have your fish dinner. Um, the last option I have down there is, is kind of a uh, relatively new option, but it's uh, I've been recommending it quite a bit. It's been gaining a lot of traction. People are really liking it. Um, that's the stock hybrid striped bass. Um, hybrid striped Straight bass um, are a top end predator type species. It's a hybrid between the striped bass and the white bass. And so this fish is very popular. Um, it grows very fast. It is an excellent fighting species in terms of sport. That's one reason the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department has stocked it throughout the state in many of our reservoirs. Um, but what few people don't realize is it is excellent table fare. Um, just south of College Station here, um, Southwest, is the world's largest producer of hybrid striped bass. Um, he produces around 3.5 million pounds of hybrid striped bass um, food fish a year. And yet, I've never seen it in a grocery store in Texas. And when I ask other people, they've never seen it in a grocery store. The reason why? He doesn't sell in Texas. He ships all his product exclusively to high-end restaurants on the east and west coast. So this is a fish that is six ounce filet is going to cost you thirty to fifty dollars in the restaurant. So they are excellent table fare, great um, sport fish. So it's a really good option. Now combine that with the fact that you can stock the hybrid striped bass in addition to the hybrid sunfish, and you can make a really really good. Um, both sport and eating pond. Stocking. Now, when we're talking about new ponds or ponds that have went dry and are just now being refilled, that's real common in Texas at this time. A lot of ponds have went dry. So how do we go about stocking that new pond or restocking that one that went dry? Well, if you have a pond that's one acre or greater in size, if it's fertilized, if you go with fertilization, you can stock 100 largemouth bass, 1,000 sunfish. 
Now, this 1,000 sunfish can be uh, either 1,000 bluegill, or it can be a combination of 800 bluegill and 200 red ear. Um, I personally prefer going with the 800 bluegill and the 200 red ear option. The reason for that is they are both good bait fish for your largemouth bass, and they're both great food fish in their own right, but they don't compete for resources. So in the long run, you actually end up with more pounds of fish per acre that way. The reason why is bluegill feed predominantly on insects their entire life. Red ear, another name for them that some people might recognize, they're also called shell cracker. The reason they're called shell cracker is because they feed on snails and mollusks and crustaceans um, their entire life. So they're not competing for directly for the same resources, so you end up having a greater population of these sunfish out there. Um, other benefits are, those of you that have caught red ear, they get um, quite a bit larger than bluegill, um, and their fillet yield is quite a bit higher. So you actually get quite a bit more meat per, per fish, and some people just like it because it adds another species to catch. Um, so then most ponds, and you're going to see this throughout, when you stock your bluegill or even the spring before you stock your bluegill, you want to go ahead and add 5 to 15 pounds an acre of uh, uh, fathead minnows. Now, I get calls all the time that people stock the fathead minnows, and especially if you let them reproduce um, that first spring before you stock, begin to stock fish, your pond can literally be full of thousands of them. You see them everywhere. And then a year after you stock your fish, I start getting phone calls that, hey, this pond used to be just full of these fathead minnows, and now they're all gone. Do I need to add more? Well, the answer to that is no. You can add some more fathead minnows, but think of them solely as supplemental feeding. What those fathead minnows are there for, their main uh, purpose is that they are fat, slow, dumb, tasty snacks. That's all they are. They're there to help that fish population become established. Okay? And so if they're gone, that means they've done their job. So don't worry if those disappear. Now, in our fertilized ponds, you can stock up to 100 plus catfish per acre as well. Um, like I said, we're going to get into a little bit more depth in our catfish in just a moment. Now, if we have an unfertilized pond, it's really simple. You're just going to cut your numbers in half. 50 largemouth bass, 500 bluegill or 400 bluegill and 100 red ear. You're still going to stock that same 5 to 15 pounds of fathead minnows per acre, and you can stock uh, 50 catfish per acre. Now, what's really important, say I have a 10-acre lake, and I don't want to pay to stock every acre. You can stock at a one acre rate, and what that does is basically it's just going to take a longer time, a couple additional years, for those fish to multiply, and they're going to fill the rest of that lake. What's important to remember is your stocking ratios. You always want your, your sunfish to be at a 10 to 1 ratio with your largemouth bass. And that's where we're deriving these numbers from. So, quickly, I'm just going to run through some common pond species. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. Um, first and foremost, this is our largemouth bass. Um, most of you likely know this species. It's quite common throughout Texas. It's probably the number one um, recreationally sought species. Um, and it's generally our top predator in our ponds. This is a bluegill. Um, for those of you that don't know, the opercular flap is that little thing that kind of looks like an ear right above the fin on their side. Um, if the margin of it is black or blue, dark blue, all the way to the edge like this, well then that's a bluegill sunfish. This is a red ear sunfish. And as you can see, um, it has a red margin along the ear, 
flag with a red margin. And as you can see, it's much deeper bodied. Um, they can be much more robust in their thicker, um, both through uh, the tail section, which is the caudal peduncle, and if you look down on them from above, they're much wider than the bluegill. And so you can see where we actually get a, a good bit more fillet off these guys. This is just your typical fathead minnow. And remember, these guys are small, they're slow, they're not that bright, they're just there to be fat, slow, dumb, tasty snacks. And we're going to stock these to help our fish population get established. Now, this is a hybrid sunfish, which most people probably are not that familiar with. Um, this particular one is a hybrid between a, a uh, bluegill and a green sunfish, which is the most common hybrid. There are also hybrids between um, uh, bluegill and uh, red ear sunfish, but those are less common and difficult to find. Um, so as you guys can see, they are quite robust. Um, this guy's belly and uh, fillet depth are much, much greater than that of a bluegill. And then when we specifically we look at the size of that mouth, we have quite a large mouth on that size of sunfish. And if we go back to our picture of our bluegill real quickly, see how small that mouth is? It's a very small um, mouth that's specialized for insects. Well, our green sunfish has a much larger mouth, which means he can eat, consume insects, he can consume uh, larger crawfish, he can consume larger bait fish. He gets a lot more food, he's a lot more aggressive, and he can eat a lot more. So you can see how these guys can be quite fun, and they get to a much larger size so that you can have good meat off your bluegill. Bluegills tend to be smaller, and you have to fillet a couple hundred to get a, a good amount of mean off them to feed uh, several people. Next up, this is a hybrid striped bass. Um, as you can see, this one is laying uh, next to a fishing pole on a dock. Um, this is actually from a gentleman's pond, um, probably about 20 minutes outside of College Station here that I uh, convinced him to stock some supplemental hybrid striped bass into his pond uh, about a year and a half ago. These guys were stocking at six inches. Um, a year later, they were pushing 14 inches and uh, just shy of two pounds. Um, and as you can see by the fishing pole, he was having great fun catching these guys, but remember, they're also excellent eating. And so if you're considering these in a, a pond that already has an established uh, largemouth bass population and it's in balance, generally we only recommend 10 to 12 additional uh, hybrid striped bass per acre. These guys do consume quite a bit of forage, so we don't want to overstock them. And they're kind of seen as a, um, a bonus fish. They can get quite large in the pond. They can get up to 10 pounds in the pond, although four to five pounds is more common. Um, they fight very hard. A one pound hybrid striped bass fights the equivalent of a five pound largemouth bass. Um, so they're, they're excellent fighters. And the good thing is they don't generally compete with uh, directly with our largemouth bass. Largemouth bass are shoreline, um, structured, cover-oriented predators. They're ambush feeders. How, whereas the hybrid striped bass, they are open water pack hunters. Uh, they swim in schools. They um, don't um, congregate around structures as much, as much. They're constantly moving throughout the open water seeking bait fish. So they're not really using the same habitat areas and feeding necessarily on the same items. So they don't directly compete. But if you stock too many hybrid striped bass, they're forced to start utilizing some of the same resources as large mouth bass. So we don't want to overstep. Um, I just threw this one in here real quick um, because a lot of people consider stocking triploid grass cart for vegetation control. Triploid grass carp are um, excellent um, for control of many species, not all, but many species of only submerged aquatic vegetation. Okay? They're not real great for most of our floating vegetation or our emergent vegetation. Now, 
the reason that these guys are so good is because if you see the picture, the, the perennial teeth right below this grass carp's head in the picture on the right, or in the bottom left, those uh, close-up picture of their perennial teeth, that is an extra set of teeth, basically, that they have in their throat. And those teeth, you can see how they're highly grooved, those are used, they rub back and forth against each other to grind aquatic vegetation. And that's why they're so good at utilizing. So you may consider um, stocking a uh, triploid grass carp for vegetation control as well. Um, if this was a vegetation control um, presentation, I would go more into depth in them. But since this is a basic stocking and we're running short of time, I'm going to keep moving along. Catfish, um, there's our question mark. You have to answer yes to two questions before you should ever stop channel catfish. Um, the first question is, will you fish for them? If you won't fish for them, there's no reason for them to be there. Some people say, well, I want it to be, you know, a more complete ecosystem. Well, think about channel catfish and how many natural lakes we have in the state of Texas. We only have one natural lake in the state. Yet catfish have been here for thousands of years. That means they evolved where? in our rivers and our streams. They don't belong in still waters such as ponds and impoundments. Okay, that's not where they evolve. So you're not adding anything to that ecosystem by stocking catfish in it. The next question you have to answer is will you harvest them? Um, even if you fish for them, but you do not harvest them, they're probably doing more damage to that pond than what you realize or what you want. So if you're not harvesting them, cat root fish reduce the food available to bass and sunfish. All right, so that means those other desirable species aren't gonna grow as fast. Now everybody thinks that catfish are bottom feeders and they only feed on the good stuff, and so how could they be competing with my largemouth bass? Well, if anybody's watched those um, documentaries in Africa about lions and gazelles and all that other stuff, what happens to the sick, the weak, and the old? They get picked off by the top predators, right? And they get picked off before they die. Okay? And so, if the bass are picking off all the sick, the weak, the injured, and the slow, what food is there for catfish if nothing's dying? Few people realize that catfish are actually very good at predators. Um, they do consume most of their food as live forage. And so they are out there competing with them. And unfortunately, that forage may be your small bass, maybe your small sunfish. Um, so you have to think that um, they're a direct uh, competition. Additionally, if you stock catfish, they will not maintain a population in the bass pond. The reason for that is that about a three to four inch channel catfish is a favorite food of largemouth bass. And so they are very good at picking them off. Sure, occasionally uh, one or two will make it through each year, but it's not enough in general to sustain the population. So, you stock 50 channel catfish or blue catfish per acre if you're not fertilizing or feeding, and 100 to 200 per acre if you're fertilizing or occasionally feeding. And that can be as little as two to three times a week. Now, it's real important that you be able to distinguish the difference between the blue and the channel catfish. I personally uh, recommend the blue catfish for various reasons. Um, one, they mature much slower, um, so they're going to mature at around five to six years of age, um, whereas the channel catfish matures at two to three years of age. Um, so they're going to get much larger um, before maturity, and what that means is your meat quality stays better for a longer period of time. After channel catfish become sexually mature at about two, two and a half pounds, um, the meat can become gamey, it becomes tougher, it becomes rubberier, uh, more rubberier. That, that's not a word, but that's how people often describe it. And the reason for that is the same in other species. 
Once they become sexually mature, they start producing more progesterone, estrogen, and testosterone. It goes back to that, would you rather eat a nice young suffering piglet, or would you rather eat that old boar? Um, it does affect the meat quality. Um, so, the blue cats, the way you tell the difference, and it's very important because blue cats cost much more than channel catfish. And if a fish supplier thinks that you don't know the difference, and you ask for blues, you go, oh yeah, yeah, sure, 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 I got, I got some blues here. Alright, so how you tell the difference is real simple. The top picture is of a blue catfish, and the bottom one is of a channel catfish. When we do this, we look at the anal fin. But if the anal fin is straight, it's a blue catfish. If the anal fin is rounded, it's a channel catfish. That's the number one identification characteristic. Now, if you are really anal, um, get it, it's the anal fin. Um, if you're really anal and you just have to know for sure, now you can count the fin rays. Uh, a blue catfish has 30 to 36 anal fin rays, whereas a channel catfish only has 24 to 29. However, I myself am not going to get down and count fish rays. Um, so I'm going to look at is the tail straight or rounded. Now, we do not want our flatheads in there, right? We previously covered this. They're major predators. They can consume our good fish that we want. Plus, they're difficult to catch. Side, I don't think we need those when these pictures on the right are a blue catfish. Blue catfish can um, easily achieve 100 pounds plus. Now, they're not going to do that in a farm pond, nor do we want them to. Now, you can leave, if you're somebody that is really interested in trophy cat management, what you can do, go ahead and stock your blues and start to harvest them out as they become um, mature, about two and a half to five pounds, but you can do a fin clip. So you can clip a dorsal or a pectoral spine. They have a spine at the leading edge of those. And so you can uh, fin clip anywhere from four to ten per acre. And if someone catches those fish, they have to release them and allow just those few fish to remain out there to grow to your larger size. And that way you're not putting a burden on your bait fish and your bass population and everything else in your pond. Now, in a pond, you know, a typical farm pond around three acres, the max size these guys are going to top out at is about 30 pounds. 10 to 15 is going to be common. So they're not going to be giants in pots, but they will offer a big fish potential. Um, stocking catfish only ponds. Um, I'm going to skip this just due to I'm already been over a time. I know we started a little late, but I want to get to some management options. Stacking catfish only ponds are kind of like if you want to produce a, a large quantity of fish just for food. And so we're going to skip that real quick. Now, when we're talking about stocking, we often have to think, you know, are we overstocking, especially on our catfish? Um, maybe you have too many fish. You have too many pounds per acre. And when we talk about this, you know, so if you hit, drop a little bit of feed on the ground when you're feeding the fish and the fish leave the water, like in this photo, to get the feed, you might have too many fish. And when you come out the next morning and you see them all bloated and floating upside down, you probably have too many fish. Um, if you get too many fish, more than a thousand pounds per acre in your pond, and you don't have a lot of supplemental aeration, you're just looking at the potential for a disaster with a low dissolved oxygen fish kit. So we don't want to get, allow our fish population to get too high. Um, some common unwanted species that we do not want to stock in our pond. That is, all of them have various reasons why we don't want to stock them. Maybe they compete um, for food. Um, or prey upon our sports species that we want. Maybe they affect spawning either by eating eggs or consuming um, small individuals to, to fry to hatch out. Maybe they prey on our young bats. Um, so some of these examples are a gizzard shed, which is the picture on the top right. Um, now, we don't want to stock these guys um, just due to the sole reason, this fish over here is approximately eight months old. 
and it's quickly growing to a size that's too large for most large male bass in that pond to eat. We can stock thread pins yet. Those are fine. Those are going to top out about five to six inches in length. Those are good. We just don't want gizzard shag because they grow so fast, our bass really can't utilize them. And then what they do is they eat all the plankton out of the pond. We don't want to stop golden shiners in our pond. They're major egg nest predators. Um, they will eat the eggs out of largemouth bass and bluegill nests. Um, we don't want to stop crappie in our pond. They over reproduce and, and they're very difficult to manage. We've already covered that we don't want to cover flatheads. We don't want to stop common carp, gar, buffalo, bullheads, or green sunfish. Okay? Those are unwanted species that we shouldn't be adding to our ponds. Let's talk real quickly about crappie. Crappie equal over reproduction. So all those fish that are directly above the dollar bill, um, most people realize that a dollar bill is around six inches. So that places all those fish around four inches in length. And so these were shocked out of a pond where the, the pond owner said that he stocked crappie and he had several years of really good fishing. And he was catching very large crappie. And then all of a sudden one year, he just stopped catching them, and he thought something had happened that all his crappie had died off. Well, what had happened was they had reproduced to the point that they were becoming stunted. And he had caught out all the larger individuals and they had become older and died off, so that all that were left were these small individuals. Now, you know, the typical fathead minnow he was using was three inches. He put a jig on that, and it's as long as the, these fish. So obviously he wasn't catching any, so he tied that up. When in reality, um, they were very numerous in this pond. Now, the problem with these is not only that they reproduce to the point where they can build this population. When we look at these fish, when they were opened up, all these fish were three years old. They were all sexually mature and reproduced. And we can tell that from a little bone in the ear called the otolith. So think about it. We have a bunch of three-year-old crappie that are four inches in length, sexually mature and reproducing, and we'll never be able to utilize them as a food source. Crappie are difficult to manage in a farm. Uh, maintaining balance. Um, when we talk about balance in a pond, we always want to have a predator to prey ratio of around five to six pounds of uh, forage to one pound of predator. So typically we want to have five to six pounds of bluegill to one pound of largemouth bass. And that's kind of where those stocking ratios of the 10 bluegill to one largemouth bass come into play. Those are the ratios that give us this proper balance. And so how do we know that? Well. We, we can do some saning in our pond, both in the spring and the fall. We're looking at the size of those fish that we're catching. Um, we definitely want everybody to keep really good catch records on our pond. Um, just a few years of catch records can be used to determine your fish population and the population structure and the age of those fish. So it can tell us a whole lot about your pond. So it's a really good idea. We encourage you to keep all the records you can. Bass. We want to look at the size and condition of our bass. Our bluegill, the same thing. And for our, our catfish, we want to check and make sure there's no reproduction. If we're getting lots and lots of small catfish, uh, we want to make sure that's controlled before they can overpopulate our pond. All right. So how do we do that? We do some simple staining. Um, along the shallow, we don't stain the entire pond. It's just real simple. You can use one of those little nets that you get at Walmart, those little sayings. Um, they're generally uh, 10 foot in length and 4 foot deep. And you're just staying in shallow areas and you're looking to make sure uh, you have good fish reproduction. And you're doing it in the spring and the fall to make sure that those young of the year that you have are actually growing. Um, what we're looking for are young of the year bass that um, are small in size, such as these. We're also looking for bluegill, making sure there's good reproduction, but we want to make sure that there's all different various sizes so that we can feed all the sizes of fish that are out there in our population. Remember, the prey size must match the bass size. All right, And this photo demonstrates it really well. Um, if we have a bunch of those um, larger two size classes of bluegill that we see there towards the top, well, 
aren't bass down at the bottom, those guys are going to be starving. Um, and so there's not much we can do about that. I'm sorry, my phone is ringing in the background. I have a little bit of So we're just going to keep going. Um, now, if we have a bunch of those small bluegill at the bottom of the screen, well, then our large mouth towards the top are going to starve to death. It would be like me walking a mile to pick up the popcorn kernel. I'm going to burn more energy um, getting it than I'm going to actually receive from the food. Now, if it's walking a mile to get a Big Mac, then it might be worth it. So we need to make sure the prey size matches the, the uh, fish size. Okay? One real important thing to remember. Bass, you know, never choose to be interaction. They don't have self-esteem issues. They don't wake up in the morning, look in the mirror, and go, God, I look fat. All right? Um, they want to be the big fat bubble all the time. They will consume the prey of the proper size um, whenever it's available. Oftentimes, um, largemouth bass, when prey is abundant, they will gorge themselves to the point where they will regurgitate the prey and then continue to feed. Okay? So we want our bass to always look fat. We're looking at bass condition and we have these small skinny fish and we see a couple of additional things such as an enlarged eye and tail. I, would, I assume most of you would agree the fish on the top is smaller than the fish on the bottom but yet when you look at the eyes, the fish on the top has an eye that is a little larger if not the same size as the fish on the bottom. The next thing we're looking for is a skinny body. Obviously, these guys are not fat bubbles, they're not football shape. We're looking for that classic football shape. These equal stunted bass. Um, I kind of breezed over it, I'm sorry. Um, the large tail relative to body size. So this tail looks pretty close to what it should be for the body size here, but here we see on the bottom fish, its tail is much larger. That, that tail belongs on a fish that's about two pounds, and this guy is only around 10 ounces. All right. Um, I'm running really behind. Uh, Clint, do you think I should keep going with management options? Um, get some feedback. Yeah, I would say just just roll through it. There's not that many slides left. Uh, if we can get through those, we've got a few questions, but it looks sure. like most people are still still sticking around. Okay. All right. Um, like I said, it's difficult to cover. Uh, on management in an hour, but uh, so now we're getting to the fun car part and the fact that in small impoundments fishing is the key to management. And so my wife has quickly caught on that, you know, when I leave the house and I go, honey, I'm, I'm going to work, I have to go manage some ponds. She's quickly caught on that that means I'm going fishing. So it doesn't work real well for me anymore, but for most of you, you can probably still get away with it. So. In our maximum fish production strategy for our pond, what we're going to do after we stock, we're not going to remove any bass for the first or second year after stock. At the start of our third year, we're going to start to begin removing all small skinny bass that we see. You know, small bass are fine, but they should ha have that nice classic football shape. If we're seeing ones that look skinny, they need to be pulled. These tend to be the fish that are in the 10 to 16 inch range. Sometimes they're smaller. And what we need to do is we need to harvest 10 pounds per acre if our pond is unfertilized. And what that really means is we're looking at 25 to 40 small bass per acre per year. Because our, you know, on average, a 10 inch largemouth bass in uh, Texas actually only weighs about a half a pound. So we're looking at quite a large number of smaller fish that we want to move. Now, if we're fertilizing our pond, we're probably looking at removing at least 25 pounds, if not more, per acre if you fertilize. I mean, think about that. If you have a 20-acre pond and you have to remove 25 pounds per acre per year, that's quite a few fish. You're probably going to need some help in management. So that is our key to developing our most fish production. Once again, you got to keep records though. How do you know you've removed enough fish? How do you know you've removed that exact poundage? 
Well, if you're not weighing and measuring and counting the fish, not only you, but requiring the people that fish there to do the same, you have no idea how many fish you've actually removed and if you're meeting your management uh, requirements. Um, it's really common for ponds that, um, where people allow family members and friends to come and fish. So if Bubba and Joe come fishing on Saturday and they remove 15 fish, and then Larry and Mike come fishing on Thursday and they remove five pounds of fish, and then um, Uncle Mike comes in on uh, Friday and removes another 10 pounds of fish, and nobody's recording it, how do you know that you've met your management requirements? You simply don't. So we need to keep records. So that was our maximum fish production option. However, many people aren't looking just for the most fish out of their pond that they can get. Many people prefer, say, a trophy bass option, looking at a big bass option. So in this scenario, what we would be looking at doing is we would remove 10 to 15 pounds per acre of bass under 12 inches. And then we would also be removing an additional 5 to 10 pounds per acre of bass between 12 and 15 inches. Then we would be releasing all our fish over 15 inches. And you can set a, uh, you can either leave it so that all fish over 15 inches must be released, or you can um, set a trophy limit for those that, you know, eventually want to harvest a, a wall hanger. And here we generally put, most of Texas can support a 24 inch um, maximum trophy limit. However, over time, as you fish your water, you may come to realize that 21, 22, 23 inches is the largest bass that you're ever going to produce in that pond. And so it's okay to set your limit at those sizes but I want to reduce it to that until you really see what your growth potential is in that pond. Now, how does this option work? It seems counterintuitive. Most people are say, I want to grow trophy bass. Why am I harvesting more and more bass? Well, I guarantee you, if you're removing even this um, 25 to 30 pounds of fish per acre per year, you're not removing all the bass that are out there. So there's some that are always going to make it through this process. What you're doing is you are thinning out the crowd so that the, the limited amount of resources that are there then become unlimited in terms of growth of those few individuals that remain. So think of it in this scenario. If I have um, 50 people in a room and I have um, 25 sandwiches, or I'm sorry, I'm doing this completely backwards. Say I have 50 sandwiches and I have 100 people in a row. Well, some of those people are going to go hungry, right? Some people aren't going to get to eat. Now, if I re reduce those people by half, and now I have 50 people, well, everybody's going to get some to eat, but they're not going to get very much. Now, if I reduce those people in half again to 25, now everybody's going to get plenty to eat, and they're probably going to start growing and perhaps getting fat. So that's what we're doing. We're reducing that population so that the, the limited resources and food that are there become unlimited to the few individuals that remain. And when I say few, there's obviously much more than few. Now, there's some, there's actually, uh, it's a smaller uh, subset of anglers that prefer trophy panfish, um, but they are perhaps even more diehard than the bass fishermen. And so there's people that really, really want to produce large bluegill, large red ear, large sunfish. And so the management strategy for that is you immediately begin to harvest all bass over 16 inches. Why do we do that? Well, research is showing that 13 to 16 inch length bass remove the sm most small um, bluegill and sunfish from the population. So we're going back to that thinning stretch. A few are going to make it through and survive, and by thinning out the crowd, they have unlimited resources. Not to mention, now that you're limiting your bass population to 13 to 16 inches, well, once a bluegill reaches about 
seven to eight inches, it's now too large for any of the bats to consume, so it can grow unhindered. Right? Nothing's going to eat it from that point on. It just dedicates its time to growth. So that's how we end up creating a large um, sunfish population by managing our bats. Once again, we got to keep records to make sure that we're meeting our management goals. Now, I know that we said we generally do not recommend stocking crop. All right. Um, in Texas, we generally don't recommend stocking crappie in anything under 20 acres. And believe it or not, Texas is a little bit more liberal than many of the states around us. And, and it's weird to say that, obviously, that Texas is more liberal. But um, consider states such as Mississippi that, can, that don't recommend stocking crappie in anything less than 50 acres. And it all goes back to that it's difficult to manage a small body of water for crappie because they overpopulate so much. Nevertheless, I always get those people that say, I don't care what you say, we're going to stop crappie eating. And so there is one crappie option, um, and it takes intense management, but it can be done. Um, that is to stock black crappie only in small impoundments. Um, we don't want whites, we just can't control their reproduction. We're going to stop black crappie only. Now, if you have less than one acre, absolutely not. Um, I have three in parentheses because even though, you know, less than one acre, I, I really can't in good conscience recommend it to anyone that has less than three acres. All right? So here's the caveat to that, though. You would have to choose bass or crappie. Um, the only way to really produce good crappie in a small impoundment that's consistent through years that's going to produce fish over one pound long term is by overcrowding the bass. It's the same as our big bluegill option. We want to create um, an intentionally stunted bass population that consumes large quantities of those uh, small crappie thinning the herd and then those ones that do survive through that and become large enough that the bass can't eat them, then they're going to grow to a larger size with unlimited resources. Okay? Now, through this process, um, by managing a crappie, you're rarely ever going to catch a large bass from a properly managed crappie pond. Okay? So, how do we stock for this option? Well, in new ponds, we need to stock 200 largemouth bass and 300 black crappie per acre as fingerlings, okay? And as you can see here, that whole predator-to-prey ratio of 10 to 1 that we maintain with the bluegill and the bass typically goes right out the window. Um, we need to have a much larger largemouth bass population so that we can begin to thin those black crappie out and keep them in check. Now, if we have an established pond with balanced uh, bass bluegill population, first of all, please, 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 if you have a balanced pond with a good bass bluegill population, don't mess with it. Don't stop cropping. It screws everything up. But if you're, you're determined to do this, well, all you need to do is stock 15 adult black crappie per acre. The reason we've got to stock adult is because you already have large enough bass in the pond. Once you stock your 15 adult black crappie per acre, you need to begin immediately catching and removing any bass over 15 inches. Once again, we're looking to create that crowd of small hungry bass to help thin the crappie population. Um, what this does, it promotes faster growth of those, whoops, I misspelled crappie, um, of those crappie that remain. Um, Real quick, we always have somebody that talks about structure and cover in our ponds. Um, there's only two things I recommend, and that is wood and rock. Um, wood is great. It's a natural cover. Um, wood actually lasts a very long time. It can actually last for decades underwater because the water acts as a natural preservative. Um, it's also, um, because it is organic, um, food such as parathyroid and algae grow on it, which attract those small bait fish, which in turn attract your predator fish. Next one, rock. 
The reason I like rock, it adds a lot of minerals to your pond, but the main reason I like it is because if I put a pile of rocks in a pond and I fish this pond and I don't fish it again for the next 20 years, when I come back, I know right where that pile of rocks is going to be. It's not going to move. It's not going to deteriorate. It's going to be there. And rocks have lots of great nooks and crannies where um, crawfish and bait fish and other things like to hide and gather. So it's really good structure and cover. And so with that, um, I'm wrapping up um, the presentation for today. Sorry I ran a little bit long. I was trying to put a lot of information, but um, at this time we can have uh, Clint join us and we'll answer some questions. I appreciate that, Todd. Outstanding presentation. Uh, and for those of y'all who are still with us, I appreciate y'all sticking around. We've got some questions to, to follow. If you can't stick around for all those, we will archive the webinar. It'll be posted up on the TWA website. So at any time, you can go back and access the information that was covered today. Uh, we'll try to get through the questions fairly quickly. The first one came in early. It says, uh, purchase some copper sulfate crystals to control pond scum on the surface. Safe or good idea for fish? And it is a one acre pond, two foot on one end and seven to eight at the deepest point. Okay. Um, copper sulfate, um, you have to be extremely careful with. Um, it is one of the recommended uh, uh, algaecides for algae. Um, it's very common. Um, the problem is copper is a heavy metal, and heavy metals are toxic to just about everything. It's also very toxic to fish. Um, that is why the maximum uh, label dosage on any copper product is those one part per million, because toxicity begins in fish at about one part per million. So you really have to know your treatment area, your water volume, and how to measure your, uh, uh, your treatment before application in order to apply it. Now, copper has some other things that are dangerous. Um, it's more toxic to fish in low alkaline waters, so you need to know the alkalinity of your water and make sure that you have alkalinity of um, around 25 parts per million or more. Generally, we like to see it in 50 parts per million or more if you're going to use copper. Um, other types of issues with copper, um, the toxicity of it does change with uh, temperature as well. So um, you're really going to want to read that uh, specimen label carefully. Now, I'm not familiar with this particular product. Okay, you got a smart crystal. So this it is a crystal. Um, copper sulfate is sometimes sold pre-dissolved. But if you buy the crystals, which is the cheapest thing that you can get, and that's why people always buy it, what they do is they throw it out and uh, it immediately sinks to the bottom where it's completely useless. Um, copper is a heavy metal, precipitates out of water, sinks to the bottom. That's the definition of a heavy metal. But in order for that copper to be effective, it has to contact the algae cells to destroy it. And so what most uh, places that sell these, a lot of farm and feed stores, and it's simply just because they don't know in order to use copper effectively, you have to first dissolve it in water and then spray it out over the uh, vegetation. Now, if you went with um, some of the chelated copper complexes, uh, that eliminates a lot of the alkalinity issues. Um, they're more stable. Um, they last longer in the water column than um, copper sulfate. Um, they're already in a liquid form, so you basically just mix with water and spray. There's no dissolving process, so it's a lot easier. Okay. Uh, next question. Best source for pond liners for a half-acre pond that will not seal? Okay. Um, there's just so many options out there. Um, and it really depends on your needs. Um, first of all, you know, there's several different types of materials that you have to consider. Um, you have to consider rubber versus plastic. You have to consider um, geotex with uh, bentonite clay. Um, 
sealed within it. Um, those are the three options. There's a couple more out there. Those are the three most common. Um, so, for example, a really heavy, heavy duty one that we use for commercial culture, it's actually what mines our aquaculture ponds out at our, our aquaculture station. Um, we use a, 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 it's a Firestone product. It's a rubberized uh, pond liner. Um, it's uh, 60 mils thick. So it's a very thick product. Um, it's very puncture resistant. It's somewhat affordable. It's about middle of the road in terms of that. Um, the plastic liners are by far the cheapest, um, but they also have the most uh, durability issues. Um, and the durability tends to come from if you have wildlife or cattle or horses, you know, other livestock that visit the pond regularly, um, they seal the pond bottom very well. But what happens is as those animals uh, approach the edges or even enter the water, their hoods tend to poke holes in the plastic, which over time they create seeps, which lower the water a little bit lower. So then that animal has to go a little bit lower to get more water eventually, and so it pokes holes lower. And so it keeps eroding away at that. So they work fine as long as you've got a controlled environment where you don't have a lot of wildlife visiting the pond. Um, now, the geotech text that has the sealed bentonite in it, um, that's available from uh, a couple manufacturers. Um, what I don't have a ton of experience with it, but from the people I've talked to that used it, they're not generally real happy with the results. Um, for one thing, it inhibits fishing a lot because that geotex material um, snags, lures, uh, in, any exposed hook or anything that comes in contact with it, it snags, it hangs it up, or it lose your lure. Two, it's really easy to disturb it so that um, even though you might lay it down and have it holding water, um, animals that burrow in the pond, um, crawl around on the pond, even you snagging it with a fishing lure or livestock entering it, can really disturb that material and allow seepage to begin again. Um, so those are kind of your options. Like I said, I would go with a, a mid to high thickness of the rubberized liner material. Now, being an extension, we cannot recommend particular manufacturers of materials. Um, that's just part of the job. All we can do is advise you on um, what would work best for you. So uh, at this time, I'm sorry, I, I just can't provide manufacturer names. That would be an endorsement for one company. Okay, uh, next question. Any suggestions for a timeline or product, uh, which you just talked about products, but to rid the pond of the current bloom and then refertilize? Currently they have a 12 to 15 inch visibility at the deep end of the pond. Okay. Um, first of all, we want to make sure that it is a bloom that is your visibility. Um, and, and if you've got a good green color um, and you can get a jar in the water, hold it up and it looks uh, like clear water with a green tint to it, then it's an algal bloom. But if you're holding it up and it kind of has any type of milky appearance, uh, even if it's milky green or some other color, then it could be a clay issue. So that may not be complete visibility due to it. Now, assuming based on your question, if it is, a, a bloom situation, what you would want to do is actually use a copper-based product, algicide. Um, so you can either use the, the copper sulfate like we previously discussed, but I would recommend most likely a chelated copper complex um, for the reasons, like I said before, um, it's, it eliminates alkalinity issues, it's more stable, it's long, it remains in the water column longer, so it's longer acting. Um, it's got many more advantages in terms of application. Um, the thing is, if you have 12 to 15 inches of visibility and you treat that bloom to remove it, you do not want to re-fertilize. Um, the, the issue with that, when you kill all those algal cells, is once they lice, they're going to release that phosphorus contained within the cell so that you're going to have um, 
a, a very quick regrowth um, of algae based on that available phosphorus. And so actually what you might want to consider doing is actually um, fertilize, or, uh, treating that pond for the algae and then using a phosphorus binder um, or aluminum sulfate to bind the phosphorus to remove some of it from the water quality from the water column. That way you don't immediately come back with a, a very intense algae bloom. Um, you're not really wanting to change it. You're trying to remove some of those nutrients so it's not so thick. And so that would be the best way to proceed in your case. Now the thing is, I want to treat the whole pond at once. Because if you've already got it that thick and you go out and sell the algal bloom, you are killing an enormous mass of vegetation and that can actually lead to a low dissolved oxygen issue because um, all that decaying um, algae is actually going to be decomposed by bacteria that consume oxygen and so what happens is their population explodes because suddenly they have a tremendous amount of a new food source and they actually consume oxygen um, 24 hours a day at a higher rate than the algae does. And so generally you'll want to treat um, no more than a quarter of your pond at a time and what you're doing is you're thinning the algae population rather than killing the entire thing at once. Okay, that's a good natural segue mm -hmm. to the next question. Uh, if oxygen depletion is a negative with deep pond, can I add a bottom aerator and have a 12 to 15 foot one acre or a acre and a half pond? Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that's typically what we recommend, um, especially when you have a pond that's that deep, um, because think about it, if, we, if you have a stratification event during the summer at six feet, that means um, that you're going to have like an extra 10 foot depth of water that is um, below the thermocline and noxic and can potentially turn over and create one of those fish kill situations. So how to prevent that or avoid it, the most common way is simply to um, get a bottom diffuser style aerator that um, continually moves the water from the bottom of the pond, brings it up to the surface, and then it circulates back through the pond. And so what that does, that prevents that thermocline from ever developing, and so you don't have that potential for a fish kill. So yes, that's a very excellent way to do it. Okay, I just saw a question come in. I know you can't recommend a brand, but is there a certain type of aerator that you would recommend? Uh, well, a bottom um, diffuser style. Um, so when we talk about aerators, you're, you're typically talking about a couple of different types. Um, a lot of people go with a surface aerator. Um, those are the small ones that either just move a large volume of uh, water a few inches high, but it it's a rolling boil through um, there. The other types are the fountain types that shoot water up in there. Those are the, actually the most inefficient types. Um, they do not really mix the water column in any type of surface aerator, even the high volume aquaculture type ones, don't mix deep water. Okay. The only type that you can use to remove that stratification problem in a deep pond is to use a bottom style diffuser. Basically, that's one that has a, uh, a rocker uh, piston or a centrifugal type blower sitting on the, the, the bank somewhere, and it blows air down an air tube into the bottom of the pond and through the fuser stones, it's released and it bubbles up from the bottom, creating water movement. It's basically an oversized aquarium air stone in air. And that's the, really the only kind it's really efficient at removing those thermocline situations. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I know you can't recommend a specific herbicide. That was one of the questions. Is there a, a resource that you would recommend that people can read about the different herbicides, their application, and their effects? Okay. There's a different. I can recommend specific herbicides because I can recommend the. Uh, the active ingredient. I cannot recommend a name brand. So if they want to give me like the vegetation species that they're trying to treat, I can recommend several options for you. Now, the thing is though, 
Um, if you're really looking for a lot of detailed information on aquatic vegetation treatment, uh, go to our department's um, aqua plant website. Um, that's aqua, A-Q-U-A, plant, P-L-A-N-T, all one word, dot T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. Now that website has um, several different ways to work through to determine what exactly the vegetation you have. Um, so it has a pictorial guide, so if you're that kind of person that is, you know, very visual and you need to see pictures of it and match it up, there's that way, but then you can also walk through some other ways um, uh, kind of step stepwise to get down to your vegetation. And once you find, determine what your vegetation is, it's going to tell you um, all the treatment options, you know, uh, it's going to recommend if there's biological control, such as grass car or something, it's going to recommend mechanical removal um, items that are affected, and then it's also going to cover the uh, active herbicide ingredients that are most uh, uh, effective for that plant species. And so, once again, that's just, uh, or, yeah, I see it's been typed up at aquaplant.10u.edu. And so, that's a great resource for aquatic vegetation management. <clears throat> Okay, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and make this the last question in the sense of time. Um, there's a few more, but I think they were kind of touched throughout the presentation. This one came up a couple times in regards to turtles. Our 12-acre pond has numerous turtles. They specify red ears. Is it worth controlling their numbers to help the fish grow? Okay. This was actually the slide after the riprap one, but um, I eliminated that in the name of time, but I guess we should have left it in there. Um, Turtles do not, in general, bother your, your fish population at all. Um, okay, so most people do not realize that in Texas, we really only have three species of turtles that are uh, carnivorous and feed on fish. Um, we have the uh, uh, alligator snapping turtle, which is endangered, and so that means, A, it's bringer, so it's probably not in your pond, and two, if it is in your pond, since it's endangered, you can't touch it anyway. So there's nothing you can do about that. Um, the common snapping turtle is the next, which only rare instances um, can they, the population be so high of common snapping turtles that you really need to do anything. Um, that tends to be more in aquaculture type situations where you have extremely high densities of fish in, in very close quarters of where they're easy for those turtles to get a hold of so they can actually get a rather high population. And then the final ones are the soft shell turtles and I kind of lump them together. They are both smooth and spiny and um, they are carnivorous but they also, well they're actually omnivorous because they also feed on plant material. But So if we think about it, we're basically down to two, two common types that you are going to eat your fish. Snappy, common snappy turtle and um, the soft shells. Now, um, neither of those really make any kind of dent in, in a pond fish population. The rest of your turtles, the red ears, um, uh, meth turtles, uh, uh, stink pots, scoters, um, they're all primarily vegetarians. Um, so they're eating mainly aquatic vegetation. We're not hurting the fish at all. Now, occasionally, someone sees um, a group of turtles feeding on a dead fish uh, along the bank. Um, and yes, these species are scavengers. So they're good for your pond because they will help to clean up those dead fish. But generally people see three or four turtles feeding on a two pound channel catfish carcass and know that red ear slider is not fast enough to chase down and capture a two pound catfish on the pond. So it's actually performing a service. So in general, we want you to leave all the turtles in your pond alone. There's no reason to thin them really. 